Hello, I would like to speak to you about the subject of the resurrection and the rapture. We know that the rapture and resurrection should come together because when the Lord comes, he's going to come with a shout with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, and those who are alive and remain would be caught up together to meet him in the air. So this tells us that um, we should put the two subjects together, the resurrection and the rapture, because they will happen at the same time. So I just want to define the word rapture as being the doctrine that has to do with the event in which the saints of God, both the living and the dead, Old Testament saints and New Testament saints, would be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Most, if not all, evangelical churches or preachers believe there will be a rapture at some point in the future, but there are various ideas concerning the sequence of these events. There are at least three common beliefs. One belief, known as the pre-tribulation rapture, teaches that the coming of the Lord is imminent and that the rapture could occur without any warning whatsoever when people are least expecting it, even before I finish this note, or just any moment. Through this doctrine, one is taught to believe that Jesus will come and the church will be caught away before the tribulation begins. Why? How? This doctrine may be more wishful thinking than biblical truth, in my opinion. Another belief, known as the midweek rapture, teaches that the Lord will come for his people soon after the middle of the tribulation period, after the Antichrist has revealed himself, but before the seven vials of wrath of God are poured out upon the earth. This has been called the pre-wrath rapture, or just midweek rapture. It actually is something that would happen probably a little after the middle of the week. The third belief, known as the post-tribulation doctrine, teaches that the Lord will come at the end of the seven-year period, or perhaps there is no tribulation at all. Some who wonder about the tribulation wonder how it will end. That comes the time of the Battle of Armageddon, and Jesus comes. Then somehow they would put that rapture really close to that. So much has been said about the differing beliefs that many people are asking, what difference does it make? And concluding, the Lord will take care of all of that when he comes, so they take no time and make no effort to understand the end time events. And this is not a new subject. I would just want to point out to you that other people in many ages past believed in this doctrine. It's about as ancient as anyone can imagine. Some say that Job was the first book written to be part of the scriptures. A few things that he said verified that he believed in something like a rapture or resurrection. Job said in chapter 19, verses 25 through 29, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job could also foresee his death and resurrection and was confident that he would see God. He said in verse 26, And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. Job could also see some persecutions along about that time. Looking at verse 28, he said, But ye should say, Why? persecute we him, seeing the root of the matter is found in me. And then Job could see a judgment after wrath and punishment by the sword. He said in verse 29, Be ye afraid of the sword, for wrath bringeth the punishment of the sword, that ye may know there is a judgment. Abraham believed in something involving the end times too. Hebrews chapter 11, I'd like to deal with verses 13 through 16. The writer said, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Now, the following note reaches beyond the millennium into a time when Abraham's descendants will inhabit the promised land. But now thy desire is better country, that is, and heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. 
Moses also believed in in time events. He said, reading from Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 30 and 31, When thou art in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, if thou turn to the Lord thy God, and shalt be obedient to his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy father, which he sware unto them. In Deuteronomy 31, verse 29, we read, For I know that after my death ye will utterly corrupt yourselves, and turn aside from the way which I have commanded you, and evil will befall you in the latter days, because ye will do evil in the sight of the Lord, to provoke him to anger through the work of your hands. Now, Balaam was a person that we became acquainted with as reading the scriptures in the time of the Exodus. He said, I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel, and shall smite the corners of Moab, and destroy all the children of Sheth. And Edom shall be a possession. Seir also shall be a possession for his enemies, and Israel shall do violently. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth in the city. Now I'd like to speak concerning the resurrection. Let's just ask the question, what is the resurrection? This subject has to do with the fact that the dead of all ages come back to life and be raised from the graves, no matter how they died, no matter what happened in burial or where the dead rest. And they'll be given new bodies designed to live forever. Some will live in eternal bliss. Others will suffer eternal destruction. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verse 52, the last part, he said, The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. The resurrection is not a one-time thing. Paul spoke of three resurrections and listed them in a chronological order. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, but every man in his own order. He listed them as Christ, the first fruits, and then afterward, they that are Christ at his coming, and the third is, then cometh the end. So what is the order? Christ, the first fruits. The resurrection took place on the very same day that Jesus' resurrection and included many of the bodies of the saints that slept, according to Matthew chapter 57, verse 52. Later on, the number was revealed at 144,000 and listed as virgin men and also called the firstfruits, who followed the Lamb whithersoever he went. These are the same men who make up the men's choir and they sing on the day that Jesus descends to the earth for the rapture and the resurrection. You'll find that in Revelation 14.4. The second order is they that are Christ at his coming. This resurrection is next on God's calendar and is described in Revelation 14. Saints of all ages will be raised in the second half of the tribulation and judged at the judgment seat of Christ. And then the last of all resurrections, it's the third in order. Paul listed as saying, then cometh the end. This resurrection will be for those who died without Christ. It will take place in the end of the 1,000-year reign of Christ upon the earth and include all who died without Christ. A great white throne judgment will determine the outcome of this final resurrection. The difference between the two following references may not be quickly determined by definition, but there is a vast difference in the context in which each is used. The first reference compares wrath to salvation. This appointment of salvation, whether we wake or sleep, has nothing to do with the coming tribulation. So many people think in terms of wrath as the time of the tribulation. It has to be thought of separately, considered separately. From 1 Thessalonians 5 verses 9 and 10, we read, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, that a Greek word spelled O-R-G-E, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, 
That is, whether we live or die, we should live together with him. The definitions now for O-R-G-E, pronounced or gay, I suppose, properly is desire as a reaching forth or excitement of the mind. That is, by analogy, violent passion or justifiable abhorrence. By implication, it means punishment. King James Version translates it anger, indignation, vengeance, or wrath. And I found that in Vine's Expository Dictionary of New Testament Words, number 3709. The second reference has to do with the heat of God's anger against the Antichrist and his worshipers after he exposes himself in the temple in the middle of the tribulation. The word is used like this. And I heard a great voice out of the temple saying to the seven angels, Go your way and pour out the vials of the wrath of God upon the earth. Revelation 16.1 So whereas the first wrath is spelled O-R-G-E, this one is spelled T-H-U-M-O-S, which is like where we get our word for a thermometer. It has to do with heat or passion, as if breathing hard. The King James will translate it in different ways, saying fierceness or indignation or wrath. This author has this to say in a book titled Studies in Thessalonians in reference to 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, and 10. For God hath not appointed, that is, he proposed, ordained. He hath not ordained us as his children to wrath, to his punishment, or to his violent anger, but to obtain or gain or possess salvation, salvation from his wrath, no reference to the tribulation, but to eternal torment through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, whether we are alive or dead at the time of his coming, we should live together or be made alive and cohabit together with him who is alive forevermore. I'd like to note that the reference is often used out of range of its intended meaning. Many are inclined to think that all wrath and all tribulation is the work of God. It is not. When referring to the seven years of tribulation, one should consider that most of the tribulation brought on by the Antichrist. It is true there are seven vials of wrath of God that are poured out onto the earth during the second part of the tribulation, but that will occur after the saints have been taken out of the earth. Teachers of the scripture should not confuse the pain and suffering brought on by the Antichrist with the wrath of God. Christians are going to have to face horrible circumstances and conditions under the forces of evil. We can do nothing about that, but we can obtain salvation through Jesus Christ, who died that we might have salvation.